title of my message this morning is Religious But Not Saved. Religious is, but not saved. There's a guy I used to work for. His name was Steve Hill. He was an evangelist. And he would say, religion is hanging around the cross. Christianity, can you put that screen up? Christianity is getting on the cross in a minute. He would say, religion is hanging around the cross. You get about this close to the cross. You know something about the cross. You can talk about the cross. You can, you can carry on about the cross. But Christianity is actually getting on the cross. Jesus says, follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me. Crucifying the flesh. I know if you're unchurched, the crucifying the flesh might sound a little weird, but we'll get to that in a minute. But Christianity is hanging around the cross. We never really embrace what the cross is all about. Religion is hanging around the cross. It never embraces what the cross is all about. A couple of weeks ago, I taught, or last week, I talked about how we wear the cross on our necklace or, or tattoos or stuff like that. But when the cross originally came out, it was a state-sponsored instrument of torture. So the cross didn't represent salvation. It represented torture. We look at the cross, and I don't know about you, but it warms my heart knowing the price that Jesus paid. When we take communion on the communion table, we take communion because it says, do this in remembrance. We take it to remember the price that Christ paid on the cross for us, making a way out of every situation. The songs, Pastor Ted, that you picked just blended so well together with the power of Jesus Christ. I heard the call multiple times this morning through Pastor Ted. If you're here this morning and you need a touch and you need a healing, I was honestly waiting for him to do an altar call right then. I feel the presence of the Lord in this church house this morning. This morning we want to take a look at John chapter 3. And it says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. It's come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can, this, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, are, are you a teacher of Israel? Do you not know these things? Most, assur most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. And you have not received our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe them, how Will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the son of man must be lifted up. Verse 15, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I am going to go to verse 16 because it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's pray this morning. 
Dear Jesus, we come to you this morning, Lord. Father, I ask that you would anoint me to teach and to preach this message under the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would just speak to our hearts this morning and change our lives, Lord God. Holy Spirit, have your way in this church this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This morning, Jesus and Nicodemus, they were having a private conversation late one night. We don't know what he wanted to say, but Jesus guided the conversation from the start. In effect, Nicodemus took a step in the right direction, and Jesus met him more than half the way. I love how Jesus operates, because here's the thing, right? He's looking for a willing vessel. And what I love about this story of Nicodemus is he's a prime example of someone who is religious, and, but he does not know Jesus. And all he did was take one step towards Butch like this. You know, I haven't used you in a while, Butch. I'm going to use you now, okay? Come on up here, big man. Yeah. Just the way he approaches me, I'm just like, wait, did I do something wrong? <laughs> Right on. <laughs> so, so he's not Nicodemus. He's Jesus. All right. Well, you're the only one with the beard. So listen. So here's Nicodemus. He takes one step to Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He comes straight to Nicodemus. Okay. You know, in life, if you're standing there and there's somebody, come here, Ryan, Pastor Ryan. If, if <laughs> come here, if you're standing here, right, and you're, you're standing, and somebody strange comes up to you, right? <laughs> I mean, stranger comes up to you. <laughs> A stranger comes up to you, right? That stranger's interaction with you is going to be determined on one thing: whether or not you're going to receive them or not. Am I right? Come on now. So if I go like this to a stranger, he's, he's going to put his hand out just like Pastor Ryan did. But if I go like this to a stranger, what's that stranger thinking? And here Nicodemus is talking to Jesus. Nicodemus takes one step by wanting to have a conversation with Jesus. And Jesus is like, let me just tell you about who I am right now. Let, let, let me begin from start to finish, reveal who I am and why you need me. That's how our Jesus works. He's, he's, he's looking for that first move on our part. He's looking for that initial, and sometimes it's just a little tiny step like this, just enough to bridge the gap to reach the hand out. And all of a sudden, that stranger now becomes a friend. You with me? You guys can be seated. Thanks. So I got Jesus and a stranger here with me this morning. And here we have Nicodemus, he's wondering, he's a Pharisee. He's, he's uh, different. Nicodemus approaches Jesus, would be my first point. So who is Nicodemus? I was kind of getting into that a little bit. He was a ruler of the Jews. This means that he was a senator or a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a part of the ruling body of the Jews. He was a Pharisee. He was the master of Israel, that is. He held some official position of the highest rank. He was either a, a leading official or a leading teacher of Israel who was either authorized or accepted as much by the public. So here we have, <laughs> carefully saying this, here we have a politician a scholar. So when we pray for our leaders, right? Our leaders are searching, hopefully. And when we pray for our leaders, maybe the same result will take place, amen? Like Nicodemus, because he kind of fits that bill. He was apparently, he was apparently wealthy. He spent a great deal of money on the burial of Jesus. When we, and we see this in John chapter 19, verses 39 through 42. And it said, And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about a hundred pounds. And they took the body of Jesus, 
and they bound it in strips and linen with uh, spice, as was the custom of the Jews to bury him. So we know that Jesus made an impact on Nicodemus' life as well. Because even though Nicodemus didn't stand up and was silent during the trial of Jesus and really had nothing to do with Jesus during that time, inside Nicodemus by this point, based on what we're reading in John chapter 3, verse 1 through 15, Nicodemus is having the salvation experience take place. And it's evident by the fact that in John chapter 19, Nicodemus is so involved in, in taking care of the body of Jesus. Nicodemus was a part of a group who, whose uh, prestige had suffered the most because of Jesus' popularity. Here Jesus comes and he's doing all these signs and wonders. He's healing people. He's raising people from the dead. And here we have the Pharisees, the leaders of the Jews. And they're supposed to be the ones that are the most, shall I say, biblically smart. Nicodemus, the Pharisees, they held all the scripture in high regard. They believed in eternal life. And they were the ones most people thought would be able to identify the long-awaiting Messiah. So here you have Nicodemus. He's a part of the Pharisees. And the Jews are looking at him. And they're like, these guys are the ones that should be able to identify the long-awaited Messiah. Do you hear the weight that the church put in Nicodemus? So for Nicodemus to go to Jesus by night so that no one could see. Here Jesus is, he's the, he's the show stealer, if I can say that. He's blowing their minds. And Nicodemus even recognizes. He's like, there's no way you can be doing what you're doing except by the power of God. Nicodemus came on behalf of the religious. He said, we know. And they were wondering if Jesus was the true Messiah. Thinking that perhaps he is. Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah and performing the spectacular works that were prophesied of the Messiah. Therefore, he was, he was the talk of everyone throughout the nation. The rulers were questioning and wondering, is he really the Messiah? This was the, this was the question, the thing that Nicodemus felt compelled to find out. He acknowledged Jesus only as a teacher from God. He and others saw the miracles that Jesus did, and they knew something only a man from God could accomplish such. In essence, Nicodemus was asking, who are you? Who are you? You know, church, I'm going to put a bookmark right there. We're going to get into this in a minute, but the Bible says that we're to come out, to come out and be different, to be separate from the world. There's a reason. You know, Jesus said, these things you'll do and more. These things you'll do and more relating to the, the miracles and the healings and the, all the stuff that Jesus did. He said, these things you see me do, you'll do and more. All the teachings that he did and more. And, and we're to be a reflection of Jesus. Let me tell you, friend, when you're standing around the cross in the religious atmosphere, when you're standing around the cross, this isn't what Jesus did. He didn't be like, yep, that's the cross right there. Pretty cool, isn't it? Thinking about getting a gold chain and putting it around my neck. That's the cross right there. No, no, no. What Jesus did is he said, I'm the sacrificial lamb. And this is how the sacrificial lamb will be sacrificed. Because this is the will of my father who sent me. I prayed in the garden that, that this cup would pass from my hand. But God hasn't seen fit to do it any other way than for me to get on that cross. You see, and when we get on that cross, church, I got to tell you something. 
That means that we sacrifice the flesh. Man, I'm going to talk about food for a minute. I got to. I'm going to blame Josh Smith. Raise your hand. Wave. That joker got a smoker, a grill, and he's posting all over the internet those ribs he was smoking yesterday. Had them things all lathered up in some yummy yummies. And I'm telling you, man, I got in this morning. I said, how's those ribs? He goes, oh, they were divine. I'm like, mm. he said, is a rack about that big? He said, I couldn't eat it all. I'm like, a rack only that big? <laughs> I'm Houdini. <laughs> Make a disappearing act. Nothing but the bones. <laughs> you know, and, and that's the flesh talking. That's that, that's that stomach king saying, mm, some good barbecue would hit the spot right now. Come on. A good, big, juicy steak and sweet potato smothered and, and all the fixings that go on a sweet potato. I don't know what, because I just eat it. It's yummy. You get you a flat iron from Longhorns. They got that rub on there. You know what I'm talking about? How many salivating right now? Come on now. All you carnivores out there. Or, or maybe a nice big veggie tray. You know, some cauliflower and some broccoli and some... Mixed in with a little protein drink there, all natural, you know. <laughs> You're feeling me. I'm hitting the whole realm here. Carnivore to vegetarian. <laughs> and that's that flesh, man. That's that stomach king saying, I'm, I'm craving this. I'm hungry. Or how about, mm, we brought some Bluebell ice cream home. If you hadn't had Bluebell, don't come to my house because I only got about a half a gallon left and I won't share it. <laughs> But we got some Bluebell strawberry ice cream in the refrigerator last night. I had a small bowl, believe it or not, because, you know, it's limited. You got to go back down past the Mason-Dixon line to get it. So you eat it slowly, enjoy it. And that Bluebell, every bite just savory, right? Come on. That's what I'm talking about. That's the flesh right there. That's the flesh. The flesh doesn't say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to eat lunch today, tomorrow, or for the next week. That's called fasting. That's difficult stuff to do. What I'm trying to draw the correlation here is when Jesus saw the cross, he didn't see it as something delightful to get on. He saw it as something that was not delightful to get on. It's not something that everybody would want to do. Some folks in here have found the power of fasting. So I said, if you, how many folks in here like fasting? Raise your hands. We'd have a number of people. And the only reason why you'd raise your hand is because you've seen the power of prayer and fasting in hand. And you know the sacrifice of not eating food and spending that time in the Word and, and growing, closer to the, uh, to, 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 growing closer to God and hearing His voice is worth any kind of food you put on the plate. But those that don't fast... They have a hard time with not eating that food. Jesus is looking at this cross and he's saying, this isn't something that I want to do. In fact, the Bible says he was sweating like drops of blood. He was in agony. We don't get that agony. We don't understand that. I can imagine all night long he was wrestling and he was pleading. And the reason why he was wrestling and he was pleading is because he knew what his physical body was going to go through. He knew what the pain and the anguish that he was going to go through so that we, you and I, could walk in freedom. So that we, you and I, would have a way out of every situation in life. You see, Nicodemus is on to this guy now. He's like, I'm seeing some things here. We've been studying about the Messiah, and he's doing a lot of the things that they said the Messiah would do, but I don't know. I'm, I'm not bold enough, brother, to call him the Messiah. That's a big statement. I mean, look at how he's ridiculed. Look at how he's picked at. Look at, look at how my brothers, my fellow Pharisees, they, they kind of mock him and stuff like this, and, and he's overturning all of our teaching. Yet Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. You see, Jesus doesn't play games. He went right to the heart of the matter. <laughs> he just dove headfirst straight in, and he went straight to the heart issue. Miracles and signs 
were not what was important. But what was important for Nicodemus is to be changed, changed spiritually, changed within, changed completely, to undergo a spiritual change that only could be described as being born again. We've got a sweet little baby and a couple of sweet little babies in the sanctuary here this morning. So precious, so sweet. They smell so good. How many knows that little babies just have a great smell, right? Friend, even if that diaper is full, they still have a great smell, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mama's like, you're touched in the head, boy. <laughs> but there's something about being born, a fresh newborn baby, so innocent, so moldable, so, so pliable, so trusting. You know, that childlike, that childlike faith. There's no questioning, am I going to eat? When you're that age, there's no question. There's no question, is your diaper going to get changed? And they probably, they're not laying there like, I need some food. <laughs> they don't even know. It's just that there's no question there. They're going to be fed. They're going to eat. We did the growing kids God's way, and it's really teaching parents how to get on the schedule of the child more than anything. So we were blessed. Our kids didn't keep us up all night crying because, okay, here we go. So like if your child is hungry and they're crying, that's starvation mode. They're starving. How many has ever been really hungry? We played golf yesterday. I ran out of gas. Halfway through, we came into the clubhouse to visit the clubhouse for a minute. And Paul and Ashley, they're eating their hot dogs. I'm like, I'm saving mine till the end of this round or to the end. Man, to the end, I come dragging it. I'm like, I'm so hungry. I'm so hungry. They're like, you should have ate your hot dog at half at the turn, right? I'm like, yeah. And it's like, by the time a child starts crying, it's because they're starving. You miss that hour and a half window of feeding, and you went too long, and their bodies are, their stomach is growling. Anybody got any growling stomachs besides me here this morning? Their stomach is growling. And you have that childlike faith where when you're meeting those needs, that child is content. And then if they cry, it's just to expend energy. And it's one of these things where when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about being born again, imagine, right? Imagine being that baby again. Just imagine that. I know that sounds weird, right? But just imagine being that baby again. And when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus again uh, about being born again, it's, Nicodemus, you can be born again. You need to be born again in order to see the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? That means that you need to have a change, a change spiritually, a change within, a change completely to undergo a spiritual change. In other words, I don't look at life the way I used to look at life. Born again is a new birth, a new creation, a regeneration, a spiritual birth, a rebirth of one's spirit, a new life, a renewed soul, a renewed generated spirit. It is the regeneration and renewal of one's spirit, of one's spirit and behavior. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Crin, come here. You knew this was coming. I used your other boy, your other child. Huh? What'd you say? <laughs> all right. Is she asleep? No, no, no. Can you see? I see it. Look at that. Turn this way. Oh, my God goodness and she cute look at that little thing is she awake now no can you guys see her this is cassie, this is cassie. she's such a cutie but spiritually speaking when we become born again this is where we are that's why discipleship in the church is so important that's why we have what we have with our kids' church. And in fact, at the end of the service, we're going to be honoring some promotions, okay? Because we take our, we take our discipleship serious. 
from the nursery all the way to the youth, teaching the word of God. You know why? Because the best meal that this little baby can have is the nutritious milk that's rich and full. And then as she grows, she eats healthy, good food. Not cookies, not potato chips, just kidding. Right? So that that child can grow and mentally grow healthy and strong. You see, Nicodemus is an old man. He's supposed to be able to recognize the Messiah, but apparently he just can't quite do it. Why is that? I don't know, maybe because he was religious hanging around the cross all the time. You, you can go ahead. You got it? Just be careful. Maybe he was hanging around the cross all the time. Church, I got to tell you this morning, we can't hang around the cross. In the end times, the Bible says even the elect will be deceived. Why is that? Maybe because we're hanging around the cross. Maybe because we got away from got away from the heart of Jesus, hearing the voice of the Lord. Maybe we got away from the mentality of pick up your cross and follow me. Maybe we've gotten away from the mentality of, of being a new babe in Christ and how the old man and the old ways and the worldly things are dead and gone. And behold now, you are a spiritual child. You are a young babe in Christ and you need to feed yourself on the word of God. I'm going to tell you, friends, sometimes you got to read even if it doesn't make sense. Because I'm going to tell you right now, broccoli does not taste good. Cauliflower does not taste good. Brussels sprouts. Now, turnip greens, fried okra, that all tastes good. (laughs) Right? But all that good stuff that doesn't taste good is good for your body. So you can take, cauliflower is the white, right? You can take the cauliflower. I just eat it. I don't question it. You can take the cauliflower, dip it in some ranch dressing. Now it tastes good, baby. Now it's a good snack at night. Yogurt for the, let's not go there. It might not make sense necessarily as you read, but your spirit is getting the nutrition that it needs. Church, you see, Nicodemus, he was wondering. He was wanting to know, are you the Messiah? Are you the one that I've learned about all my life? I need to know. There's too much going on around you. And it reflects being the son of God. In 2 Corinthians, Paul was presenting the results of Christ's death for us and our death with him. Because we are united with Jesus both in his death and resurrection. That's why we baptize people in water. It's a public confession. You come up and the new man comes up. It It represents Jesus coming up out of the grave. It represents this old man being dead, and behold, here's a whole new person. I want to get on down to verse 16 and bring this to a close. The Bible says, behold, all things have become new. As believers, our lives should be changed because we are being transformed into the likeness of Christ. When you look at 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, But we all, with unveiled face, behold as a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. You see, when I got saved, there was some bondage that was still in my life. I had some bad habits that this body was addicted to. But it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's through the faith and trusting in Jesus that your freedom comes. It's 
It's recognizing. It's somebody telling you when you get saved, listen, you may have battled with this stuff, and because this has been a lifestyle, you've got to recognize the lifestyle. And you've got to say, you know what? This is no longer a part of my life. This no longer reflects the word of God. Jesus, another thing my old boss used to say is, he would say, what is sin? What is sin? It's anything that Jesus wouldn't do. He, he would make statements like, the stuff that you watch at home, could you put it on the screen in the church house and watch it in the screen in the church house with everybody around you? That kind of stuff. The stuff that we read, the stuff that we watch, the stuff that we listen to. You see, all that stuff, and I'm not up here trying to come against all that stuff. I'm just saying that when we get saved, we are a whole new creation. We're new in him, and we're to reflect him in every aspect and every area of our life. The only problem here is the world has said, you don't have to live that strict because now you're just being legalistic. Friend, I got to tell you something. October will be 24 years to Tanya, married to Tanya. 24 years. I can't believe that that silver one is a year away. I'm not that old for that stuff. <laughs> right? <laughs> Shh. Let's keep focused. Stay focused. <laughs> 24 years. For better or for worse. And in sickness and in health. Till death do us part. For better or for worse, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. You see, the Bible says that God created man and says, not good for man to be alone. How many men can testify to that? It's not good for us to be alone. <laughs> That's why he created woman. And the word rib isn't in the ancient Hebrew from what I'm studying. There's another word, and it's, I can't pronounce it, but it's, Looks like the word Tesla. But what it means literally is to carve out of the side of. So when God put Adam to sleep, he literally carved Eve out of the side of Adam. That's why in the Bible, in the New Testament, it says the two become one flesh. The two become one flesh again. Because that's the way it was originally. I don't know. I'm not going to get into Adam and Eve doctrine here. But I'm just telling you, when God put Adam to sleep, he carved Eve out of the side of Adam and said, here, this is your helpmate, Adam. Trust me, you'll need her. And you're to be a covering. And when the two become one flesh, the strength that is in a unified marriage is unstoppable in the kingdom of hell. Do you understand what I'm saying? Why do you think marriage is under such attack in today's society? Why do you think people live together and don't ever get married? It's because it's a perversion of what God intended for us to live in. There's a fullness in the marriage that takes place. There's a completion. Any guy and woman in here that's married can testify to that completion. I am nothing without my wife. No, really, I am nothing without my wife. If my wife wasn't in my life, my kids would eat pizza all the time. It's quick, it's easy, it's $5 a Frisbee. You don't even have to buy drinks, they can drink water. <laughs> but it's one of these things, church, where there's a completion that takes place in us. There's a fullness that takes place in us. And when I got married to my wife, I said no to everything else. When I gave my heart to Jesus, I said no to the, my old former ways of living. I said yes to the new direction. I said yes to the word of God. I said, Lord, I don't know this word very well, but I want to be more like you every day. And the only way, church, that we can do that is by getting in his word, reading his word, studying his word, meditating on his word night and day. You want to put something together and you want it to work right, read the directions. If you want to put something together and waste a bunch of time, and it not work right, and eventually have to pull out the directions, don't read the directions the first time around. I got a grill for our Pam, for our wedding, a gift. I got home from our honeymoon. I said, Tanya, we're gonna put this grill together. We're gonna grill out like a married couple. 
Took me an hour to put that grill together and something didn't look right. Just telling you, didn't look right. Tanya goes, where are the directions? I'm like, I don't need directions, it's a grill. Ruh, ruh, ruh. Blow up my chest a little bit. I'm a man, I don't need, this is a grill. I don't my way around a grill, come on woman. She's like, well, we ain't grilling on that because it don't look right. To this day, I'm not quite sure, Tim, what I did to that grill. But when I humbled myself through my helpmate, bringing me the directions, saying I'm hungry, I had to tear the grill completely apart. And start, it took me another hour to put the grill because I had to tear it apart. It took me another hour. And Daniel, when I put that grill together, it was meant to stay together. So I'm over there trying to break all these things loose. But you know, when we got that grill, when, when I got that grill finally put together right, we had some of the best hamburgers and chicken on that grill. It was awesome. The more you get in, the more awesome it is. The more you dive in and pursue the holiness of God, the sweeter it is, church. It changes your perception. It changes the circumstances around you. It changes your view. It's because you're a whole new man and you, you think a whole new way. And then when you look at a problem or you look at a situation or you look at a diagnosis, you're not looking at it the way the world looks at it. You're looking at it through how Jesus looks at it. And you finally start to understand, I truly can do all things through Christ because he'll give me the strength. I've heard that all my life, but it never made sense because I was always busy hanging around the cross. Hanging around the cross. I heard a pastor one time he has five children. They're all grown and married, most of them. But I heard him years ago preaching when his kids were young. And apparently he was getting a lot of parental advice from babysitters who were single and had no children. And he said, he said, you know what? If, you, if you've never been there, don't come and try to tell me how to get there. Somebody that hangs around the cross, friend, has never been there. They haven't tasted. It's kind of like the Samaritan woman. Jesus said, I'll give you a drink that'll change you forever. Well, you'll never thirst again. Nicodemus, being born again. Behold, all things have become new, transformed into the likeness of Christ. 2 Corinthians, I don't know if I read this, but we all with unveiled face beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Instead of living for ourselves, we as followers of Christ now live for him. Instead of evaluating others with the values of the world as followers of Christ, we look at this world through faith. We don't look at this. If you look at this world right now, whoo, yeah. Our lives should be changed because we are being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Instead of living for ourselves, we live now for Jesus. Instead of evaluating others with the value of the world, we look at the world through his eyes. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. As followers of Christ, how do we look at the world? For God so loved the world. Not the worldly ways, but the people. Last week I preached about the harvest. For God so loved the world. He saw the world. He saw the harvest. He saw the hurting. He saw the need. So he said, I'll give you my only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world, he gave us his son. His son made a way out. The evidence of the kingdom. My last point, I'm done. Jesus said you must be born again in order, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Jesus repeated the importance of being born again in verse 3. Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Can never see it. We can't grasp it. We don't understand it. We don't know it. Verse 5 says, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The Bible says that the way is narrow, and only few will find it. Friend, this morning, as I'm closing, that's my third close, as I'm closing, if you're hanging around the cross, this is where Nicodemus was. And Jesus is making it very clear. Unless you're born again, you will never see the kingdom. Unless you get up, get on the cross, sacrifice that flesh, crucify that flesh. Listen, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. I obviously love a lot of good food. And when it comes to lunch on Sunday, the biggest thing is what am I craving? What are my taste buds dictating to me of what we're going to eat? That or what are my kids telling me we're going to eat? But the flesh is weak when it comes to the spirit. But the flesh is like a Goliath when it comes to the spirit. We just have to recognize that our spirit is like David. Our spirit is strong. Our spirit is willing. Our spirit will do it. So this morning, if you would please, I know the kids are coming in. If everyone would stand, we're going to give an altar call. Just, I have to give an altar call on a message like this. Jesus emphasized the absolute necessity of a new birth. You must be born again. The word must means absolute necessity, imperative. This morning, if you're here, with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here this morning and you, the Spirit of the Lord has said, listen, you're a fine person, you've been doing great things, but you're hanging around the cross. If that's you, I want you to just step out and come on down to the altars. If you're here this morning and you're saying to yourself, I need to dedicate my life to the Lord. I need to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If that's you this morning, I want you to step out. No one's looking around. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. This is between you and the Lord. But I want you to step out and come down to these altars right now before we go any further, any further. Jesus. Jesus. If the Holy Spirit has been challenging you this morning and saying, it's time to tighten up. It's time to lay these things aside that so easily ensnare us. They hinder us from running a race. If that's you this morning, I want you to just release those things right now. Don't hang on to them anymore. I'm not going to give an altar call for that other than right where you are. Release those things. Pick up the owner's manual. Jesus says, be holy is my Father is holy. Holiness comes from studying his word. Holiness comes from the oneness of being with Jesus. Holiness comes from being in the presence of God Almighty. Holiness comes from repenting and turning from the worldly way of doing things and the worldly way of thinking things. Remember Corinne's little baby, that precious innocenceness. When someone gets saved in church, unfortunately, people get saved and they stay as infants for the rest of their lives. And they don't grow spiritually and they don't spread their spiritual wings so that they can raise up those around them. But Bethel, we're here to raise up those around us. We're here to go and make disciples. Amen. We're here to reach the lost. So I want to leave you with this charge this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus, that your hunger for his word will grow deeper than it's ever grown before. 
that your desire for his word will grow deeper than it's ever grown before. And your understanding of his word will grow deeper than it's ever grown before. And Father God, we just thank you right now for your sweet presence in this church, Lord. We thank you for the work that you've been doing in Bethel, God. We thank you for the fresh touch that you're bringing right now to Joyce, right where she is, and giving Don strength, Lord. And Father, for touching Lynn's body and being with her, Lord. Father, we're believing in healing for both of these situations, God. Father, we're looking for the praise report, Lord Jesus. We're praying the prayer of faith like your word says to do, Lord. And Father, I pray now that your spirit would just begin to reveal to us the rest of this week the importance of reaching those around us because the harvest truly is ready. In Jesus' holy name.